Okay, so this is the lecture four of the advanced graph theory. So last time we learned about, I mean, application of flow theories to matching. And also we go over about the touch one factor theorem, which we have learned in undergraduate graph theory. And then we learned about this concept of F factor. So F factor is for each vertices, you, each vertex, you designate certain number, which is F of B for the vertex B. And then you want to find the spanning subgraph of G, which has a degree same as F B at the vertex B. So you pre-specify the all the degrees of the vertices, and then you want to find the spanning subgraph with that specified vertex degree. So if the all the number is one, then it's a uh, same as one factor, which is a perfect matching. So it's a generalization of matching. <coughs> and for that, we define this F blow up. And in this graph H, which is an F blow up of G, it's easy to see that uh, if we have a uh, one factor in H, then we can find the F factor in G. And then how did we define is that uh, if we have a vertex B, which has degree four, but the F value two, then we define excess degree, which is four minus two, which is two. So you take the degree and you subtract the F value. And then you, what you do is you put four vertices, degree many vertices in here as a A, B, and then excess many vertices in here on as B, B, and then you put a complete bipartite graph between them. And each of these edges, you tear them apart. So these four edges are joined, by, joined at this vertex B, but you tear them apart. And again, you tear these I mean, edges apart at, the, at all the vertices. And then you put it in this way so that uh, these edges, I mean, are actually connecting one vertex in AV and the other vertex in AU. <coughs> in such a way that uh, these all blue edges are disjoint. Then that's the definition of this F law. This can be defined as long as all the vertices, in all the vertices, the value of F value at the vertex B is at most the degree, which is integer. So, <coughs> with this knowledge that uh, having an F factor in G is same, I mean, equivalent to the statement that H has a um, one factor, and then we combine that with touch one factor theorem, then we can actually prove a sufficient and necessary condition for a graph to have a F factor, which is the touch F factor theorem that we have stated last time. So if G is a multigraph and F is a non-negative integer value function, then G has an F factor if and only if qst plus ft minus degree sum of the vertices in t is at most f of s or all disjoint sets s and t which are vertex set where this q ST is the number of 
components, say Q, which we obtain from deleting the vertices in S and T from G, where the F value sums of the vertices in Q plus the number of edges between S and T is odd. Let's give some color. <coughs> so why do we get this weird relation? Weird looking relation. So why do we have this QST? Actually, the CST is not difficult to show. So we will actually skip the proving the CST. You can prove it for yourself. So just assume that uh, you have an F factor H. And then when you have an H and you have this vertex set S and vertex set T and the rest of the vertices, and then try to count the number of edges of H which meets at least one vertex vertices in S. So this is actually, so when we write the function with the vertex set, this is summation of all vertices in there, I mean, whose value? So this is the F value, sum of the F values of the vertices in S. So this actually counts the number of edges which meets in S while the edges inside of S is counted twice. <coughs> and similarly, you can actually analyze what this actually means. And then from that, you can actually pro prove that uh, such a condition is necessary. So let's show sufficiency. Sufficiency means that if this condition holds for all vertex at S and T, then we can actually find the F factor in G. <coughs> so first, so our strategy is to take a F flow up of G, and then there you use the touch one factor theorem to show that the, such an F blow up has a one factor. Then it naturally gives us an F factor in the original graph G. For that, we need to first check that uh, its F blow up is well defined. So, because we have this condition given, by using that condition as S be the say empty set and T be uh, just one vertex set, then what, what do we know? Here, <coughs> this is zero, and then this becomes the degree, and then this is, I mean, the degree, I mean, F value of the T. So what we know is that we obtain F value of W is at most its degree for all vertices W. Thus, F blow up of C is well defined. So let it be H. <coughs> and if touch condition holds for this graph H, then we are done. Because touch one factor theorem says that uh, we can find the uh, one factor in H, which will translate into F factor in G. So we can assume 
Hotspots Condition Fails for this F factor H <웃음> So let's see Be a minimal pot set So again, what minimal touch set means in H, you have C, this vertex set. And then once we delete it, we have several components. And then among these components, the odd components, the components which have odd number of vertices is right in this way. And then this is actually smaller than the size sorry it's this is actually bigger than the size of c so if some set satisfy this condition that's tough set among them we choose the minimal or minimal such set which means that once we delete this one vertex from c then it's kicked out from c so now say some components are merged together because of this so with this setup, this smaller set is no longer a touch set. That's what this minimality means. <coughs> but in this picture, this C cannot really be a minimal touch set in this specific picture. Because if let's say this is x, then we consider c minus x. So originally we have g minus c and c. And we know that this is bigger, right? And then now you don't delete x, then this becomes one smaller because we kicked out of x. But number of odd components, because of this get kicked out, these two are merged together to one. So there used to be two, say, odd component, but now there are at most one odd component. So this also decreased by at most one. So in this specific picture, C is not minimal because you can just kick out of x and then resulting is still resulting set is still touch set. <clears throat> From this observation, we can actually know something. We actually know something. If C contains a vertex with neighbors in and most two components of H minus C. Then what happened? We take C and we delete X. Then we used to have C and then this X1 and then there are one vertex X and there are several components. Once we kick out of this, it, it's either, if there is no neighbor of X, then we get uh, one more odd component. If there is one component which has a neighbor of X, then now one odd component might be gone or one odd component might be created but there is no case that the, you lose two odd components and then if it has neighbors in two components then number of odd components could go down by two but this new component if, if both of them are odd then this new component is also odd so it increase by one, so in total, you lose at most one odd component. If both of them are not odd at the same time, then 
you might lose just one odd component, but never two. So this is at most the number of odd component, at least the number of odd components in H minus C minus one. But as she is taught that this is strictly bigger than C minus one, which is size of C minus X once we kicked out. So this inequality, so this is strictly bigger than this. So it's a contradiction that the C, are, C is a minimal constant. So what we know, let's say, we know that every vertex in C has neighbors in at least three components of H minus C. So now we have this graph G and H. For each this V, we have the A V and B V, and we have this complete bipartite graph between them. And then, and also only the vertices in this A V has a neighbor outside, and this. B vertices in this BV has no other neighbors. So that's the clear from this construction of F law. So these vertices doesn't have any other neighbor, any neighbor other, other than AV. And also these vertices here has only one neighbors outside of this cluster. Because, I mean, these vertices has neighbors in BV and except that, we have only one neighbor using this blue edge. So using that, using this structure, we can actually prove some fact that, uh, <clears throat> I mean, how this toss as she looks like. So we have she in this H. But we don't want the situation that the C contains, C looks this way. C contains some vertices in VV, but not all, but some vertices in AV, but not all. We want to show that this doesn't happen. So somehow, I mean, this V was one vertex in G, but in H, it is no longer a one vertex. There are AV and VV. But we want to show that the, they are also kind of clustered together so that, the, I mean, they kind of act like a one vertex. So either all of them are in C or none of them are in C. <clears throat> if we know that, then we have better understanding of the structure of this touch set C. And then we can actually figure out how to apply the given condition to conclude some things about touch conditions in H. So let's prove this claim. So for each vertex in G, we have one of the following. Three happens. So let's say type one. B, V is entirely in C, but A, V is not. None of A, V, A, V is in C. And type 2, B, V is not in C, but A is entirely in C. And 3, Sorry, I didn't write that uh, it's empty set. And VV is not in C, and AV is also 
I didn't see. Sorry, I noticed that the, I wrote uh, inequality here, but uh, this must be empty. So, <coughs> so we show that one of the three situation holds. So what it means is that uh, this purple C does not happen. So it's either you have this AB and BB, then your C either contains one of them, so I or AB, but, non, but no vertices in BB, or all vertices in BB, but no vertices in AB, or none of them. So it also doesn't happen that the, uh, I mean, all of them are in C. That doesn't happen. So let's prove this claim first. <clears throat> so we have AB and BB. So let's say we have So if BV has a vertex X in C and Y not in C then what happened? Then the vertices in AV A, B, not in C, all lie in one component of H minus C. Give me a moment. So, hmm. so we know that uh, these vertices in X and Y has only neighbors in A, B. So this doesn't have neighbor outside. It only has neighbor in in A B. So if there is a vertex X in C, Y not in C, then this A B must be non-empty. Because I mean, we assume that uh, there is. I mean, if there is an isolated vertex in G, and if it has a f value zero, then we can just forget it. So, in, if this vertex is not in C, let's say G, if G is not in C, <coughs> then, Then this is con connected with this Y. And in H minus C, they all belong to just one component. So, 
what do we have? So we have C, and here we have X, and then here, here we have Y, which belongs to a component of H minus C. There are several components, and one of them contains Y. And then X has only neighbors in this specific component Q. It doesn't have any edge to outside. It cannot. Because all the neighbors of X is lying inside of AB. And then any vertices in AB which is not in C lies together with Y in this component. So this is a contradiction to the previous star. <clears throat> because, I mean, we show that the X has neighbors in at least three components of H minus C. But it shows that in this case, this is only one. Even if, I mean, all the vertices in AV lies inside of C, even if this happens, it's the same. Because this X in that case has no neighbors, I mean, no neighbors in any of the component. <clears throat> so in any case, we get uh, this contradiction if VB has two vertices, one in C and one in not C. So hence, we have that VB is entirely in, in C or not intersecting C at all. So one of them happens. So let's consider first case. If this BV is entirely in C, then again AV, PV. Let's say we have a vertex X here in AV, which also lies in C. If this, there is such vertex, any such vertex has at most one neighbor in H minus C. Why? Because all the neighbors of this X actually are in BV, and then there are at most one neighbor outside. That's from the definition of this F law. Any vertex in AV has neighbors in BV, except there is one neighbor outside of this BV. And because this is already in C, so we have this set C, and we have this X. All the neighbors are inside C, except there is this one neighbor. So, its neighbors lie in at most one component. Again, this is a contradiction to star. <coughs> so, there cannot be any vertices X which lies in C. We have all the vertices in AV are not in C, so V is of type 1. So, remember that, uh, recall that, I mean, this logic actually applies even when BV is empty set. If BV is empty, then, I mean, the, this logic exactly applies. There is no edges inside, but uh, there is only one edge, so which is contradiction to this star. So now, what's the other case? So we can suppose this BV does not intersect C at all. And further, BV itself is not empty set. So again, we have AV and BV. So if there exists 
So now we want to show that the every vertex in AV is in C. Contrary, contrarily, if there is a vertex in AV which does not lie in C, and a vertex X which is in AV and C, then what happened? All of the vertices in VV lie in one component of H minus C because we have this C which is not in C. So we have C and we have X and G. And this G is adjacent to all the vertices in BB because BB is entirely outside of C. <coughs> so all of the vertices in BB lie in one component of H minus C. Now, X has neighbors in and most two components of H minus C because it could have neighbors in where? BV. Except BV, it has only one neighbor which may go to other places. Again, this is a contradiction. to the star. <coughs> Hence, C contains all or none of the vertices in AV. Hence, either type 2 or type 3. So, again, Type 2 is that the older vertices in AV lies in C. Type 3 is none of them lies in I mean, C. And type 1 is the older vertices in VV lies in C, but none of the vertices in AV lies in C. So this proves the claim. Now with this claim, we can show that uh, if the touch condition doesn't hold in H, then the given condition of the theorem, this condition is also, I mean, violated with certain choice of S and T. So what's the choice of S and T which violates the condition? The following. So for given a uh, minimal touch set C, we let T S R be the vertex subset of the graph G consisting of type 1, type 2, type 3 vertices. So we have this G and H. We have <coughs> T, S, R. So these vertices. And then we have here C. And for vertices in here, let's say X, Y, G. Let's not just write G here. we have, so in R, there are several components of G. <coughs> so T is of type one, which means B, X lies in here while A, X is outside. 
and y lies in s means that a y is here and p y is outside of c and in h we have certain i mean sets corresponding to each c1 c2 c3 and c1 c2 c3 so c1 consists of several vertices say gw then in c1 we have uh, ag pg uh, aw pw with uh, certain edges in here if this c1 was a connected set then this is also a connected graph <coughs> so that's the situation So now we want to show that with this choice of T and C, the condition given at the theorem is no longer satisfied. So recall that <coughs> size of VV is same as the excess of the V, which is actually T v degree minus F of V, and size of AV has size degree and we have one more thing here that the number of odd components in H minus C is bigger than C so now we want to show that this S, T and S contradicts our assumption so by con construction what's the size of C Size of C is you count all the vertices in Vx and all the vertices in Ay and sum together. So, which is summation of size of AV for all V in S plus summation of size of BV and all the V in T, which is summation of all the degree in S, summation of, of all the excess degree in T, which is degree of the vert degree sum of the vertices in S and degree sum of the vertices in T minus FT. <coughs> so let's say this C1, C2, C3, let's give some name. Let say bold C be the set of components of CR. Then we want to claim that the, so these are connected, but this may not be a component because some of the vertices in AV or AX or VY can be, I mean, attached to this. So we want to show that how these are attached and then what's the component in this H looks like. So C be the, let's make it not look like a complex number. Let's see be the set of components of this G once we delete T and S. Then components of H minus C are actually one of the following, say type. So here, So we know that this vertex in BV has no other neighbor. It's all neighbors are already in C, which is we delete this. We delete C, and then now we see how the component looks like. So each of these vertex become a component on its own. So which is first type? Say A, we have Y, which is in BV for, for some V in S. And in that case, it has a size 1, order 1. So we have uh, this one vertex component. 
And then what's the other type? And this vertex in AX. It's all neighbors are in BX except one. There is one other neighbor. And that neighbor could be either in here. I mean, in say, you have AX prime. Again, X prime is in T. Then either it can send edges here to another A X prime or to say here another A Y prime or to some other vertices in this, I mean R, which is so A W where W is in here. So those three situation can happen. So, but if the first one holds, then how does this become? These two vertices have no other neighbors. I mean, all the other neighbors are in C. So they become a component of order two. So say YG with, so this Y is not same as this Y. So let me just write it. Yeah, maybe this choice of letter was not good. So this Y, this Y, G are not the vertices in here, in G. They are vertices in H. With Y in A, U, let's change this to U. <clears throat> so one is in A, U, and the other one is A, V, and U, V is an edge in both, there lies in both T. This has size 2. And again, the other possibility was it can have neighbors sending to this AV, which lies in C. In that case, it has size 1. So Y in a, B, or each edge, say, U, V, which lies between S and T, having order 1. And what's the other case? The other case, the last case is, is that this sends some edges to outside, outside C. And in that case, so the vertices in here could have several neighbors in this a, some a sub u. So before we have c two here, but now we have c two with some vertices attached. So that's the this c two becomes. I mean, in this shape, in this pic picture of H. <coughs> so each this component become new component here, new component in H, except that the uh, I mean every vertex here is blown up into A V and B V, and then some one vertex are attached in this manner. So there are four types of component and then we want to count the number of odd components here. So the number of odd components of type A, B, C, D are so first type is exactly each VV has size EV, so we add the excess degree of the vertices in S. And then second type, because all the this, I mean, component has size one, 
and second type has all the components has order two, so none of them are odd component. And the third one is that the, for each edge between T and S, it gives us these two, I mean, vertices are connected, and then this becomes, I mean, component with size one. So there are the number of such edges, the number of edges between T and S. And the last one is actually same as QST. So what was the QST again? It's a, let's go back. It's a component of, I mean, number of components Q of the graph G minus S and T, where F Q plus number of edges between Q and T. So I load it here long. This is not S, this is actually Q. Sorry for that. So this is odd. So if some components satisfy that this is odd, then you, you count, and otherwise you don't count. In this case, we claim that the, the number of odd components which satisfy, I mean, this type D is exactly Q S T. Because we can actually show that, indeed, consider a component of H minus C corresponding to a component Q. Say we have a component Q here, and then it becomes this, I mean, this shape in here. And in this component Q, how many vertices are there? It has, so we have this Q, and then it's in G, we have S and T, and we have a one component Q, and other component. And then in this H, we have C. So it has how many vertices? Each vertex here can be blown into sides A, V, A, W, and B, W. And A, W has size its degree, and B, W has size its access degree. And then for each edge between Q and T, So which is counts these edges. For each edge, you add one more vertex. So this is say X sorry. This is say X. Then here you have also X here. So you get one more vertex here. So you have to add the number of edges between Q and T. So this is the size of this component corresponding to Q. Since it gains one vertex for each edge from Q to T. <coughs> but what do we know? That's same as twice degree minus FV summation plus number of edges between Q and T. Since we want to only check whether this is odd or not, if we take a modulo 2, this is same as summation of FB. V is Q. Plus number of edges between them. So this is FQ plus number of edges between Q and T in G up to modulo 2. So this and this has the same parity. 
But by definition, QFT is the number of components where this number is odd. So this shows that QFT indeed counts the all odd components of type D. So now what do we know? We know that C is a third set. So number of odd components in H minus C is bigger than C. Then <coughs> we add the components of type D plus components of type A plus components of type C I mean, odd components of type C. So then, that's bigger than the size of C. So what was the size of C? This expression. Because we have shown that size of C is this expression. So degree sum of the vertices in S and degree sum of the vertices in T. And you subtract the F value sum of T. Then we rearrange how you move this F here and then you this D and this cancels out and then you move this and move the, this f value the other way, then you get qft plus ft minus degree of t minus eg ts is bigger than fs. <coughs> However, what have we assumed? Give me a moment. One something. So, what's this quantity? So this is the... You have T, and then you have the degree sum in T, and then you subtract the number of edges between T and S. So this is exactly the... You take the G minus S, and then take the degree sum of the vertices in T. So this is QST plus FT minus G minus S, I mean degree sum of the vertices in T in the graph G minus S is bigger than ST. But what was the condition that we assumed? We assume that that expression, exactly that expression is smaller than or equal to F of X, S. So this is uh, directly a contradiction. So a contradiction to the assumption. So this contradiction means that in H, the cost condi condition satisfied. So we have a perfect matching in H, which translates into an F-factor 
in G. So this proves the f factor theorem. So with this tool, we can, I mean, show some other statements in graph theory. So, for example, I mean, 